Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello, I am Saurabh Sharma and we are doing introduction to Chinese studies. Today is the sixth lecture in the, in the series and uh, this particular lecture has two parts. In, in the previous lecture, we had done religion in China, but there are some aspects of, of Chinese religion, especially the administration of uh, Chinese religion by the Communist Party state that was uh, left. So, in the first part of the lecture, we are going to discuss the religious administration in China. It will also include some uh, human rights violations that are uh, committed in China against certain religious groups. Then in the second part, we are going to do scientific thought in China. So uh, basically, we are, we are supposed to discuss uh, Chinese science and technology, but because uh, the time would be limited. So the focus would be on uh, the development of scientific thought in China beginning with the ancient period and then we move up, up to the uh, contemporary period. So let us begin with the first part, religious administration in China. So in China, religion is regulated by the Communist Party. Communist Party believes in atheism as their uh, position on religion. So they don't believe in any religion, but uh, there is there's some religious freedom and so people are allowed to uh, follow religion so long as it is within the law of the land. So there, there is massive regulation of religious life in China and people don't have uh, absolute freedom of religion. So uh, the control of religion is done by the Communist Party through its United Front Work Department. And under it, there is a Bureau of Ethnic and Religious Work. So that looks after uh, the uh, religious uh, life of the people. And they have what is known as National Religious Affairs Administration, which was set up in 2018. So this specific uh, department uh, looks after religion and it is it comes under Bureau of Ethnic and Religious Work of the Chinese Communist Party United Front Work Department. Before 2018, the day-to-day the -day regulation of religion was done by the, a, a department of the state council. It was known as State Administration of Religious Affairs. So it was founded in 1951. It had some other name and gradually it came to be known as State Administration of Religious Affairs or SARA. But in 2018, the party took over the entire religious administration of the country. So they took it away from the government and now the party directly looks after the uh, religious affairs. Now in China, there are five recognized religions and each of them have their own associations. And these associations then uh, look after the rules, regulations and the needs of these recognized religions. So for Buddhism, there is Buddhist Association of China. Then for uh, Taoism, there is Chinese Taoist Association. For Islam, there is Islamic Association of China. For the Protestants, there is three self-patriotic movement. This is a Protestant uh, association. And then for the Roman Catholics, they have Catholic Patriotic Association. And anyone else, uh, like uh, for example, there are some Roman Catholics who, who in China, uh, believe in the authority of the Pope. They believe it is the Pope who, who, who has the right to appoint the bishops and not the uh, Chinese uh, government body. So those uh, Catholics are considered to be uh, deviants in the sense that they are deviating from the law of the land and so they are, that, that is considered a criminal act. But those Catholics which accept the authority of the Patriotic Association and, 
and do not demand that the Pope uh, should have uh, some rights in appointing bishops or deciding on, on the doctrine, religious doctrine. So, they are considered to be patriotic uh, Catholics. So, they are Catholics, but they are considered to be patriotic. Similarly, Protestants, they are regulated by the, their own association. There are many Protestants who, you know, go around uh, proselytizing secretly and uh, have churches which are unauthorized. So, government from time to time cracks down upon uh, these activities. And similarly with Islam and uh, not much problem with Buddhism and, and Taoism, but mostly it, it's, uh, the government crackdown is on Islam and Christianity because they are proselytizing. They, they want to spread their religion and, and, and in case of Muslims, there is also a, a, a kind of a ethnic difference. We Muslims are more or less now um, integrated with the Chinese society, but the Uyghur, the Turkic Muslims, they have sl uh, slight problems with integrating with the Chinese society. So, so, these are some of the areas in which the government intervenes. Also with, with Buddhism, there is uh, there are two types of Buddhisms in China. There is Han Buddhism or Chinese Buddhism. Then there is Tibetan Buddhism. Now, Tibet is a, is a problem for China in the sense that Tibetan culture is different from the Chinese culture. And so, they have their own uh, concept of the Lamas who reincarnate and, and, and so, um, you know, they have their own traditional processes by which these Lamas are identified. Now, the now, the Chinese state wants to regulate them because uh, say Dalai Lama who is, who is the most important Lama in Tibetan Buddhism is not in China. He lives in India. He is a government in exile and he is popular internationally. So, China considers him to be a traitor and, and so um, they do not want his administration to have any, any role to play in uh, Tibetan Buddhism in China. And so, say in 2007, the State Administration of Religious Affairs passed an order known as State Religious Affairs Bureau Order Number 5 on the measures on the management of reincarnation of living Buddhas in Tib Tibetan Buddhism. So, there are thousands of Lamas in, in uh, Tibet who consider themselves to be reincarnation of some deity or some Bodhisattva. And, uh, the Chinese state has ordered that no one can reincarnate within uh, Tibetan Buddhism without the permission of the Chinese state. So, so, to take a new birth, the deity or the Bodhisattva has to take the permission of the Chinese state. Only if the Chinese state accepts or recognizes someone as a reincarnated Lama, also known as uh, Tulku. So, uh, only then that person would be recognized. Otherwise, that person is again breaking the law. So, we and here we can see that uh, besides uh, in uh, case of Islam and Christianity, in Buddhism also there are certain, especially the Tibetan Buddhism, there is more or less uh, no problem with, with regards to Chinese Buddhism, which is completely uh, regulated by the Communist Party. There is no problem with Taoism because that is of, of course an indigenous uh, Chinese school of thought. In case of Muslims, Hui Muslims are more or less integrated, but the Turkic Muslims, because they are a different ethnicity, th there is some uh, issue. Okay. Now, this type of interference is not something which was uh, initiated by the Communist Party. Even as old as, um, uh, as, uh, uh, old as uh, 1792, Qianglong Emperor, he pr uh, promulgated the method of the golden urn. No, because he wanted to control the, the selection of uh, the important lamas in uh, Tibetan Buddhism because uh, the Jaching dynasty itself was uh, Buddhist, they, they, they followed Buddhist uh, religion and uh, often these uh, elections or the selections were political in nature. So, wh whoever became the lama actually determined the political st uh, status in Tibet. And so, if, if, if someone who is independent minded would, would be uh, nominated as the uh, new said Dalai Lama, that could create uh, friction between the central government in Beijing and the Tibetan authorities in Lhasa. 
and therefore this golden urn system was introduced so so instead of selecting one person the tibetans had to select a few and then their names would be written down and put in this golden urn and and there would be randomly one name would be selected so in this way the qianglong emperor believed that he could control who could become a lama and they would uh, prefer to select a person from a background which would be more friendly towards the chinese government so this particular process was used for a few generations not like the earlier dalai lamas were not under this but uh, say i think it was from the 9th 9th 10th 8th 9th 10th or maybe 7th 8th 9th 10th these dalai lamas were selected through this process the current dalai lama and the dalai lama before him was not selected to the golden urn so uh, so the uh, so they did not select all the lamas because there are thousands of lamas but three dalai lama pancham lama who are number 1 and number 2 in 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 tibet basically and then uh, jept sundamba khutugtu who is the head lama of mongolia so the mongols also follow tibetan buddhism so their head lama was also selected through this process uh, this particular post went on also to become a political post once mongolia became independent from china in 1921 uh, that head lama was then made bogd khan bogd khan uh, was the king of mongolia so the lama also became the king but then uh, the soviets took over and the and and, and the communist uh, rule was established in mongolia and so this uh, monarchy was abolished and it became a, a socialist state uh, but uh, once socialism was overthrown in the 1990s then uh, new head lama returned to mongolia uh, recognized by the dalai lama and dalai lama also has a lot of respect in mongolia so in this way the chinese state has tried to interfere in the selection of the lamas before uh, there ha have been a lot of human rights violations also in 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 uh, tibet so of course in 1950 51 there was the chinese invasion so in which a uh, lot of tibetans died they resisted the the chinese uh, occupation of their country but uh, they were defeated then in 1956 because uh, the Ch the chinese introduced land reforms in in uh, what is what was known as inner tibet basically in in sichuan and uh, qinghai so the khampas who who lived in uh, uh, eastern kham they revolted they they revolted against these land reforms the redistribution of land and, and so that was suppressed at that time dalai lama was vis visiting india and he had asked nehru for help and a refuge but, but uh, because india china relations were good at that time so nehru advised dalai lama to cooperate with the chinese authorities then in 1959 then the big uprising of the tibetans happened and when dalai lama escaped from tibet and came to india that was also brutally suppressed then of course there was the cultural revolution from 1966 to 1976 and uh, now dalai lama had gone against the chinese he had escaped from china and he was seeking the help of foreign powers to liberate tibet but the pancham lama he remained in china he was loyal to the communist party but when he saw the brutalities and and the mismanagement of of tibet by the chinese government he complained he wrote a uh, an essay criticizing chinese policies in tibet and because of that he was persecuted and in the cultural revolution he had to suffer uh, besides that uh, in the cultural revolution tibetan temples were attacked destroyed by the red guards monks were beaten up all kinds of atrocities happened during the cultural revolution that is from 1966 to 76 then again in 1987 89 when hu jintao was the party secretary in tibet uh, the tibetans protested they wanted to bring uh, to the tibetan issue to uh, to the international media this was the same time when in the rest of china also there was pro democracy movement going on so hu jintao brutally suppressed the tibetan movements in uh, during this period in, in fact uh, pancham lama died in 1989 under mysterious circumstances and tibetan still believe that he was poisoned by the chinese state then in 1995 there is this whole controversy of who would be the next pancham lama and the uh, dalai lama recognized pancham lama was abducted by the chinese state and that boy disappeared along with his family 
and the Chinese then then appointed their own Pancham Lama, who is who is currently occupying that particular office. Then recently in 2008 also there were a lot of um, protests which were again suppressed. Uh, and uh, this was in the light of the global economic crisis and also there was a Sichuan uh, earthquake. But that also failed. So Tibetans have tried to resist the Chinese but Chinese government has been very brutal. And Tibetans being Buddhist, there is a limit to which they would go in, in terms of using violence. And so recently what is, ha what is happening is there has be, have been self-immolations. So this began in 2009. So a monk would randomly go on the street pour kerosene over himself and self-immolate in front of cameras. Now with smartphones, anyone can record these videos and then upload in social media and uh, as a result, uh, attract the attention of the world to the Tibetan issue. So this is how the Chinese government have, has been managing the whole Tibetan Buddhist issue. I think I will move forward. We have already uh, discussed the different uh, autonomous regions. So for, say, I will just mention. Tibet and Inner Mongolia are essentially followers of Tibetan Buddhism. Then there is Ningxia Hui region, these are Hui Muslims here and this is Uyghur or Turkic Muslim region, Xinjiang. Most of uh, the, the remaining China follows either folk Chinese traditions or Taoism or the Chinese form of Buddhism. So there is not much uh, religious issue there. But there was and one issue that is of Falun Kung. Now Falun Kung was purely Chinese movement. Uh, started by Li Hung Chu. Li Hung Chu in 1992, he inaugurated what came to be known as the Falun Kung or Falun Dafa. So, Fa means uh, basically Dharma, Lun means will and Kung means work. So, Falun Kung means Dharma will work. Uh, Falun Dafa would mean great Dharma will way. Okay, so this was basically uh, a uh, Qigong movement. As you can see, there are some exercises that these people used to do. They used to gather in the parks, the followers of Falun Kung, and they would perform certain breeding exercises, which is known as Qigong in, in uh, Chinese. Okay, so they will have some hand movements and everyone will do it together. And so, this is a form of exercise and they believe this through this meditation, they could you know, control the life forces. And this movement became very popular. This is a form of exercise and form of, you know, in, in, in a spiritual vacuum as China was in because of uh, um, communism. So people were attracted to this particular religious movement. And according to the Chinese government, in 1999, there were about 70 million followers of this particular religious group. The problem was, this was also the number of the members of the Communist Party of China. So Falun Kung was exceeding the size of the Chinese Communist Party. Now that was a threat to the Communists because they did not want an alternative movement to be more popular than Communism. And so they decided to crack down on Falun Kung. So, uh, so anti-Falun Kung propaganda was done and then uh, followers of Falun Kung were imprisoned by the Chinese government. There was torture of, of thousands of people were tortured. Many were, had to undergo re-education that they were um, forced to give up these uh, Falun Kung practices. There were even extra, extra judicial executions. Hundreds of Falun Kung followers were killed and this was all done under the leadership of Chiang Zemin, the uh, general secretary and the president of China. Then Falun Kong basically shifted its, its uh, headquarters to United States and uh, some important organizations were found, uh, founded by the Falun Kong. So just like uh, Dalai Lama is very popular in the West, Falun Kong has also become a very recognized name in, in Western countries. So there is a famous newspaper in New York, the Epoch Times, which is considered to be ultra right wing these days because uh, the American discourse is changing and so uh, the Falun Kong has placed itself in the right because they are criticizing China and generally the left avoids criticizing China. Then there is a new Thang Dynasty television, that is a television organization and also a, a performing uh, company, art company that is uh, Shan Yun which is very famous for performing various traditional Chin Chinese dance, dance and, uh, and, and uh, all kinds of art forms, Chinese uh, dance art forms, basically physical art forms are performed by this company. 
And now in 2009, uh, the Chinese leadership formed what is known as 6521 project in order to suppress all kinds of opposition to the Chinese state. Now, I don't know if this name is, was give, is given by the Chinese government itself or it is a, a creation of the media, but uh, basically 6 stands for 60 years of liberation. So, this is 2009, so 1949 the People's Republic was founded, so it was 60 years, so 6 comes from that. Then there is 5, 5 is, uh, is the uh, year 59. So, there was uh, the suppression of the Tibetan uprising. So, Dalai Lama had, had uh, risen against the Chinese state and escaped to India. So, that is 59. So, that was 50 years. So, 5 for 50 years. Then uh, 20 years, that is uh, two, uh, 1999, that was the suppression of the Falun Gong. And then one 10 years, that would be 2009. Uh, two, uh, it will be uh, 1999 would be 10 years. So, so Falun Gong is 89 is the Tiananmen Square. Uh, so, 6 would be 60 years of People's Republic of China, 5 would be 50 years of the Tibetan uprising, 2 was the 20 years of, of the Tiananmen Square uh, movement and 1, 10 years of the suppression of the Falun Gong. So, 6, 5, 2, 1 project it was headed by Xi Jinping and uh, they have been actively still trying to you know, uh, indoctrinate or re-educate uh, people who have, whose I, who are ideologically not within the parameters set by the Communist Party of China. So, this persecution continues. Then there is this famous and recent persecution of the Turkic Muslims in the Xinjiang province. So, there have has been a separatist movement in, in Xinjiang for a long time. In fact, there were two uh, republics of e East Turkestan founded in 1933-34 and then 44-49 when uh, the Chinese central government was uh, very weak. So, uh, the first one was an Islamic Republic, the second one was a Soviet style Republic supported by the Soviet Union. If you look at the map here, so the first Islamic Republic was established in this region here close to Central Asia and then uh, the, the, the Soviet one was established here in North. But then they were defeated and then uh, integrated with the Chinese state. So, in 1949, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, it annexed Xinjiang because the Soviets, of course, stopped supporting the independent republic because China had become an ally. <clears throat> then in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, the Chinese followed the, the settlement of Han in Xinjiang. So, Han Chinese because they are, of course, uh, loyal to, to China, Chinese nation. So, uh, so, they believed in demographically changing the minority territories because minorities have, have suspicious loyalty. So, they are not uh, fully loyal to the Chinese nation being uh, separate ethnicities. So, so, the Chinese believe that if the demography is changed and Han become the majority, then that particular province will be more loyal to China. At the same time, when because there was a Sino-Soviet split in the 1960s, the Soviets started sub, uh, supporting separatism in, in China and that separatism has led to a very strong Islamic movement in Xinjiang province. Uh, in, in the 1990s and 2000s, there were a lot of riots and uh, terror activities going on in China and, and the state tried to repress them. When Xi Jinping came to power, he decided to permanently resolve this issue because the separatism is in the mind of the people. So, he decided to re-educate people. So, almost uh, 1.8 million Uyghurs were put into re-education camps, which were named voc vocational education and training centers. And they, uh, they operated. Uh, so, this is one of the pictures from Lopnur, where Xi Jinping is addressing these uh, Uyghur Muslims. So, basically, there and not only Uyghur, but Kazakh and Kyrgyz were minorities in, in, in Xinjiang. So, they were put there. This is a flag. Uh, this is similar to the Turkic flag, but blue in color. Turkey's flag is red and uh, this is uh, East Turkestan flag, which is blue. So, yeah. So, so this uh, particular uh, problem has been addressed by the Chinese state in this brutal manner. So, I... I uh, I end the discussion on religious administration here. So, we will go to the next part now that is scientific thought in China.
So the second part of today's lecture deals with scientific thought in China. Now China has been is famous all over the world for giving four important things to human civilization. These are known as the four great inventions and this concept was given by Joseph Atkins. Before that of course uh, the Europeans had recognized that they had learned certain important things from uh, the Chinese but this was articulated as four great inventions first time by Joseph Atkins who was a Christian missionary in China. So what are these four? Number one is paper. China has been making paper for more than 2000 years which is always in record and these are see some of the samples of uh, old uh, papers. This is about 2000 year old papers from China. Initially the papers were used for uh, other purposes instead of writing it was used for say wrapping things and making bags and and even uh, toilet papers were used in, in, in uh, ancient China. But gradually paper be started being utilized for writing purposes and therefore that led to the flourishing of literature in China because they started making papers. It is very, very uh, difficult to uh, preserve books. It was very difficult to preserve books in the ancient times because of, of uh, the material on which it was uh, written. In India, uh, because we used to write on leaves, these were not very stable and it used to rot uh, within a few years and so to preserve text was very difficult. By, by inventing paper, the Chinese introduced a new revolution so that these books could be maintained for hundreds of years. So therefore, we have written records uh, from China of a couple of thousand years old also. Of course, more lasting are, are, are those uh, uh, things like which are written on stone or metal and but that, that is uh, difficult to do. To carve the writings on uh, stone or metal is, is a difficult task. Writing on paper is easier. Okay, so this is a very important contribution of China. The second one is printing. So to write takes a lot of time and you need uh, expert people in writing calligraphy to write. And uh, But if you want to say uh, have many copies of a book, then uh, printing is more efficient. So about a thousand years ago, uh, Chinese developed printing. So there are two types of printing. The first type is wood block printing. So wood block printing means in a piece of wood, the uh, particular uh, writings or whatever it is, uh, say drawing or something like that is carved and then ink is put in that particular block and then that is used to print the on the paper. Okay, so this is uh, the most ancient piece of writing of printing in the world this particular piece this is a diamond sutra this is buddha and this is the diamond sutra which is one of the mahayana sutras this was printed in 868 almost uh, 1200 years ago this is the first the oldest sample of printed text in the world so this was done with wood block printing but uh, wood block printing is, is uh, limited in nature because you have to carve uh, wood with the shapes and then fill it with ink and then print. Uh, and therefore, the Chinese develop a, a better type of printing that is movable type so that the characters can be changed and, and then fixed which is closer to the modern uh, printing which, which, which started in Europe. So basically, they learnt it from China and then improvised it and then modern printing came into being in the 15th century with a, with a Gutenberg press in Germany. So, uh, so yeah, so the, the uh, printing is a contribution of China to the world. The third one is compass. Compass was used in Chinese, uh, ancient Chinese learning uh, to, to know the directions. So, this was not initially used for navigation purposes, but for say construction purposes. So, in the Chinese uh, traditional uh, architecture called Feng Shui, you have to know the direction. So, uh, Chinese developed this compass to know which is north, which is east, to know the exact because obviously with the help of the sun, you can determine the north, east, west and south. But if there is a compass, then you can do it exactly to, the, to a certain degree. Uh, uh, and then this technology was extended to navigation and uh, Cheng He's voyages used, used the compass to reach up to um, West Asia, traveling all around the South China Sea into the Indian Ocean. 
So compass was a very important contribution of the Chinese civilization. And then finally gunpowder. Now the uh, Chinese had a lot of alchemy in, uh, in the ancient times. They used to mix all kinds of chemicals to produce different kinds of products. They were always looking for uh, el elixir of immortality. Chinese emperors wanted to be immortal. They did not want to die. And so these Chinese alchemists used to produce different chemical products by mixing different things and then administer it to the emperor or say some important aristocrat who would finance them, uh, trying to find a formula that will make them immortal so that they will never die. But uh, you know, obviously there, was, there has been no elixir of immortality found. But in this whole process, gunpowder was discovered uh, by ancient uh, Chinese alchemists or you can say chemist. Alchemy is a kind of a uh, European discipline, European way of separating chemistry from the older practice of alchemy. So it was about 1000 years ago that the Chinese developed gunpowder and this gunpowder was then used in warfare very successfully. And when the Europeans, uh, they imported gunpowder for the first time and this, they learned how to make gunpowder, Europeans were able to emerge as, as world powers, European countries because of gunpowder. So in fact, all these four all these four inventions from China helped the Europeans in their colonization process. Paper of course was used for keeping records. Uh, printing was used to print uh, their, their own propaganda to, to show the dominance of the West over the colonies. Compass used, used to navigate in the ships and then gunpowder was used to defeat the, uh, the armies of the colonies. Anyhow, so these, these are the contributions of China, very famous. But the question is why China developed this kind of a scientific bend of mind. Uh, and the further question is, so although Chinese had developed this scientific bent of mind, why the Europeans were able to overtake the Chinese beginning with the 15th, 16th century? Why were they able to overtake China? Why enlightenment started in Europe and not in China? And that question is known as the Needham question. Joseph Needham, a Cambridge historian and a sinologist, in fact he was a scientist, uh, from, from a scientist he became a, a sinologist and a historian of, of science. So the Cambridge University has been publishing what is known as Science and Civilization in China. Several volumes have been published so far and this work was started by Joseph Needham. So in his works, he asked this question, why China was so advanced in scientific thought, but why did China go behind the West? Why did West overtake China? So there are many answers or many opinions on, on, on this issue. One uh, very good essay that you can find online is from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. It's titled Science and Chinese Philosophy and it has some of the some sections here as you can see, including Joseph Needham's history of science in China. So it basically tries to trace the origin of Chinese science in uh, ancient Chinese philosophy and also tries to find flaws in ancient Chinese philosophy uh, that did not allow them to go further. They went to an extent, but they could not go further. They could not develop scientific theories. They could only de develop certain, they had certain inventions or certain technologies were developed. But they never uh, went to the extent of creating scientific theories, which was then done by the West. And so the modern scientific method actually emerged from the West. So let's let's briefly look into the Chinese philosophy, some important points, and see which which would be more relevant to science. Now uh, Confucianism was the most popular uh, Chinese philosophy. Now it basically emphasizes more on human behavior rather than on material things, his opinions were more towards how human beings should behave in society. So Confucianism perhaps you can say did not play a lot of, a lot of role in development of Chinese science. Except you can say uh, uh, it, it, had, uh, it promoted meritocracy, it promoted uh, uh, learning and so in that sense maybe uh, that could con uh, contribute to science. But then again the Confucian learning was different from the, the technological education. So learning here was about cultivating uh, human behavior, 
rather than uh, building things or finding out uh, new scientific truths. So that was not the goal of Confucianism. Confucian education was basically about cultivating human behavior. So anyway, then the, let's look at some other philosophy, legalism. Now, because legalism was oriented more towards uh, success in this world, so uh, science played an important role. So if, if someone came to a legalist, a legalist king with, with a new technology, the king would welcome it because uh, that technology would help the king to maintain state power. And uh, so in that sense, legalism is uh, promotes science. And, and, and the famous legalist emperor, the first emperor, Shu Wangti, he used technology to build the Great Wall of China. And, and, and maybe uh, the problem with legalism was, it again uh, did not uh, you know, try to develop science for the sake of knowing the truth. Rather, it used science only to acquire power for the king. So that could be a limitation and therefore scientific theory could not emerge in that situation. So he, the king was not concerned with theories, he was just concerned with technology. And same was the problem in, in, in the self-strengthening movement of uh, late 19th century and early 20th century, when the Chinese uh, said that they will borrow western technology, but maintain the Chinese way of thinking. So both could go together, but they did not go together because a lot of western technology is actually based on western scientific thinking. The think thinking actually leads to technology not the other way around. The Chinese were trying to think that they could have technology without the thinking behind that technology. Taoism, uh, so in that particular essay that I cited, Taoism is considered to be a very important uh, school of thought leading to scientific development. Joseph Needham also believes that Taoism made a very in important contribution to scientific thought because uh, have, uh, as I have already mentioned, elixir of immortality was a Taoist enterprise. And so the Taoists were very good chemists and they were also very interested in understanding the way of heaven, trying to understand how heaven works. So what is, uh, what is scientific law? It is about, it is basically natural law, it is the law of nature. So in, in, in say the Chinese terminology, it will be the law of heaven. How does heaven behave? How does nature behave? Uh, so, so Taoist thought actually leads towards uh, scientific theory according to Joseph Needham. But Taoism did not become the official ideology of the state. It was Taoism was an enterprise of some individual Taoists. Uh, but the state enterprise was completely under Confucianism and therefore scientific th thinking did not lead to scientific theories in China. Then Moism, another school of thought, in Yang is also important. So in Yang you can say is, is a, a philosophy that is connected to all other Chinese philosophies. So Taoism also has this understanding of yin and yang. So yin and yang also leads to some kind of a explanation of this world. They try to explain uh, the world in terms of certain masculine energies and certain feminine energy. So there is a scientific component. So feng shui uses it, um, Chinese medicine uses it. So uh, yeah, the school of names also known as logicians, their school was not able to develop. Perhaps that could have contributed a lot to scientific thought because scientific thought is based on logic. So because Chinese logic developed but it not developed to that extent that scientific theories could emerge in China. And uh, suffice to say that uh, Confucianism remained the dominant uh, thinking in China. As a result, uh, uh, that is what uh, many of the Chinese in the beginning of 20th century said that because of Confucianism, scientific thought could not develop in China and therefore there was a need to discard Confucianism completely and adopt Western science. Only then China could emerge as a powerful country. So based on this idea, the new culture movement started in 1910s in, in, in China. This was after the Xinhai revolution when the, the Chinese emperor was overthrown and the Republic of China was established. So there are many great scholars like uh, Chai Yuanpei, Hu Shi, Lu Sun, Chan Tu Shu, Li Ta Chao, they emphasized on criticizing ancient Chinese thought and advocating, they advocated modern way of thinking, critical thinking. Don't accept things because of tradition. Test 
these ideas, whether they can be empirically proven. Similarly, they advocated that uh, there should these great social relations are all inegalitarian and oppressive uh, social systems and there is need for equality. So, the feminist movement started, the, the whole uh, uh, Confucian hierarchy was dismantled. So, so, they argued that everyone is, every, every person is equal to other and so science should be the focus and this culminated into the May 4th movement where Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy were celebrated by Chinese youth. Okay, they said we will discard the old, we will give up all this old thinking, all way of dressing, old way of eating and all that and we will adopt modern western culture which is based on science and democracy. Of course, there was a disillusionment with the west after the May 4th movement. Gradually, the Chinese started thinking more positively about the Soviet Union. So, they had a more positive view of Marxism-Leninism. So, Marxism-Leninism basically replaced uh, the liberal uh, or pragmatic scientific thought. So, earlier, say pragmatism was more popular. Pragmatic thought comes from John Dewey in, in the United States and uh, that basically is a kind of a scientific way of thinking, a, phil a philosophical thought that leads towards more scientific thinking. While Marxism-Leninism considers itself to be a scientific form of socialism, but here state control becomes more important. So, state control takes precedence to knowledge acquired through science. So, communists came to power eventually in China and during the uh, Maoist period beginning 1949 till the death of Mao in 1976, learning was suppressed. Mao was anti-intellectual, he was completely against any form of intellectualism and so when he, when he ruled China throughout that period, he suppressed the intellectuals and it is only after 1978 when China opened up that economic reforms were introduced and along with economic reforms because economic reforms is achievable only through science and technology and therefore scientific learning was encouraged in China. So, Although the Chinese state maintained a kind of a cage that would keep these uh, scientific forces or, or liberal forces in control, but within that cage they allowed certain amount of freedom. It is also known as parrot in the cage. Parrot is, is free thinking while cage is the Chinese Communist Party state. So, the Communist Party state structure will remain to give stability to China, political stability, but within that there is a lot of scope for you know, foreign ideas coming in, development of scientific thought, uh, foreign investment, special economic zones, a lot of experimentation happened in China after 1978. And that of course led to the growth of China, the GDP growth of China. China continued to grow and has emerged as the second largest economy in the world. In the uh, recent years, after, especially after COVID, Chinese economic growth has slowed down. So, the whole uh, emphasis on on uh, this parrot in the cage, you know, has, has its limitations. So, ca four cardinal principles and within that economic reforms has certain limitations and therefore, there is a rethinking within the Chinese governments. Of course, they cannot give up the monopoly of, of the Communist Party over political power in China and in fact, uh, the monopoly has increased under Xi Jinping because he has, he has personalized the whole political system instead of the collective leadership of the communist party. Now, it is the dictatorship of one man Xi Jinping and everyone has to follow whatever he orders. But within uh, that whole thing, there is a lot of uh, emphasis on knowledge which includes all forms of knowledge. Knowledge in the sense of knowledge as power, knowledge that leads to power and uh, uh, Francis Bacon, the famous uh, British empiricist, he believed that knowledge was the sake of power. So, if you want to be powerful in this world, if you want to control nature, if you want to control the progression of history, then you should have knowledge. And, and so, Chinese have recognized this and there is a lot of emphasis on knowledge. Now, knowledge, uh, creation and distribution is, is basically, I, 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 I divide it into three three parts, religion which is the ancient way of uh, preserving and distributing knowledge because religion is nothing but say pre-scientific knowledge. Then you have 
universities and think tanks which are modern knowledge creation centers which uh, uh, develop modern scientific knowledge, modern sociological knowledge, so on and so forth. And there is news and entertainment. So news and entertainment is a knowledge distribution process. And through uh, news, of course, uh, creates narrative in the world. So, so there are news programs and debates going on in the, on, on the media. But uh, there is also entertainment, which is a subtle way of developing someone's mind, creating ideas in someone's mind. So, uh, so entertainment films and TV series and all that play, play a very important role in that. And now we have the internet and social media, which uh, gives access to this knowledge to almost everyone in the world through a phone, a smartphone, people can access the internet and they can watch videos, they can uh, talk to anyone in the world through social media and thus acquire knowledge very quickly. So something like this uh, say in uh, 20 years ago would take a lot of days, you go to the library, find good books and journals and journal articles, note them down, study them and 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 to meet and discuss with experts would take a lot, long time you might write a, a letter to such an expert and wait for their response or you'll telephone people to talk to them but now with internet this whole thing has become very easy you can simply email an expert or in social media there are forums where you can debate different scientific and other issues so internet and social media has led to flourishing of scientific thought it has also led to uh, flourishing of some pseudo scientific thought because they also get a platform but uh, in when when there is uh, say both types of information available to the people then people can judge themselves whether the scientific uh, thing is more uh, convincing convincing or the pseudo scientific thing say flat earth flat earth has become very popular uh, on social media many people who actually believe in flat flat earth but this this is a fringe Large number of people has actually have begun, uh, became aware of, of the arguments made by the flat earthers and how they are all faulty arguments. And it, unless the person is blindly following that type of idea because of some other reason, maybe psychological reasons, people once they examine both the evidences, they, they understand the truth. So I believe more or less scientific thought has been promoted by internet and social media. China has utilized uh, knowledge in a very effective way. So in the field of religion, I had told that uh, Chinese state is, is based on atheism. But uh, after reform and opening up, the Chinese have recognized that religion plays a very important role in controlling people. And therefore, they are encouraging their own form of religion. Say uh, Confucianism is being revived. So the Chinese state encourages people to uh, visit Chu Fu, the birthplace of Confucius, where millions of people go during the uh, celebration of ancestors, because Confucius is considered to be the ancestor of the Chinese people. So it's an important pilgrimage site in China. Just like say there will be Kumbh Mela in, in India or uh, Hajj for the Muslims in, in Saudi Arabia. So similarly, uh, during the spring festival, uh, people uh, visit uh, Chufu. Then Buddhism, because Chinese wants to want to promote their own form of Buddhism as a competition to India. So India being the birthplace of Buddhism has certain influence in the Buddhist world. But the Chinese want to promote their own form of Buddhism uh, and also the, their recognized Tibetan variety led by the Pancham Lama. So they have created this World Buddhist Forum in, in order to interact with Buddhists all over the world and thus influence them through the medium of Buddhism. And they have also tried to suppress certain forms of religion which are which they consider to be threat to the Chinese state for example Falun Kung that I have already discussed similarly Islam and Christianity certain forms of them which which uh, emphasize more on God than on state power so long as God is under the state Chinese have no problem but if you say God is more important than the state or the nation then the Chinese won't uh, won't tolerate that and they suppress that then in terms of universities and think tanks China has built a lot of them Whatever foreign exchange they have earned, Chinese have spent it well on uh, developing the educational infrastructure in China. Some of the Chinese universities are among the top 20 universities in the world. For example, the, uh, the Peking University, also known as Peita, or the, or the Tsinghua University. Uh, these are both in Peiching. So they are among the top technological universities in the world. 
then uh, Chinese are also partnering with Western universities. They are more open now to partnering with the West so that they can learn Western technology. There's also Chinese students go abroad and enroll themselves in technological programs in order to learn Western technology and then return to China and build Chinese equipments. And so, um, of course, some Western countries have now started putting restrictions on what kind of courses Chinese students can take because a lot of these Chinese students are actually working for the Chinese state. They learn uh, Western science and technology and then help the Chinese state with that knowledge. Unlike say Indians who go and study in, in America and then, then settle in America because they are individualistic, they are not controlled by the state. Uh, Chinese are not like that. Many of the Chinese who go, go to America are actually working for the Chinese state. They want the knowledge from the West so that that knowledge can help China. So they return to China and then uh, uh, you know give the knowledge, whatever knowledge they have uh, learned, they give it to the Chinese government and then the Chinese government uses that knowledge to develop Chinese technology. And of course, there are many foreign students who come to China. They are also uh, you know, encouraged to appreciate China and so that the image of China is very positive in, in the world and a large number of research papers and patents are coming out of China. China incentivizes original research. So in that way, China is cultivating this type of knowledge. In terms of uh, news and entertainment also, China is uh, investing a lot. So there is a film and music industry growing in, in, in China. They have also made certain, certain strategic investments in Hollywood. If you, if you observe carefully, these days, some important Hollywood movies are actually collaboration with Chinese companies. So if you look at the credits, you will see Chinese companies playing a role. There is a famous movie, uh, Martian, uh, where uh, the hero goes to the planet Mars and starts a settlement there. And uh, when he has to return, the Chinese help him. Uh, and, and, and so this creates a positive image of China. I have heard that the Jurassic World series is also financed by the by Chinese companies. And the Chinese also have their own uh, media companies, for example, uh, Chinese Global Television Network or Chinese Radio International and the newspapers. And people, because the, the information flowing out of China is so much restricted, people rely on Chinese media outlets to get their information. Otherwise, it is very difficult to know what is happening in China and therefore they, these media outlets have become very important and th uh, that's why foreign students studying in China are also important. Like during the COVID crisis, we could get information of what is happening with regards to COVID uh, pandemic from the Indian students studying in China. They came online and they gave their own experience how Chinese uh, government uh, has tried to uh, you know restrict uh, the spread of the epidemic and what restrictions were imposed on them. So foreign students gave us a lot of these information and then they, they eventually had to leave China. And uh, since then there has been a lot of restriction on, especially from the, the, the country that, that is sending the students because um, Chinese situation is not very stable. And so people are discouraged, like for example in India, students are discouraged from going and studying in China because you never know what situation may evolve in the future. Uh, there are many social media platforms that China does not use the Western uh, platforms, say Facebook or Google or Twitter, all these are banned in China. You cannot use them in China. You cannot have a Gmail account in China. So you have to rely on the Chinese outlets. So you have to use Chinese social media, WeChat, Weipo. So you have to use these Chinese platforms in, or, or Paitu, that is for uh, Google search. So instead of that, uh, Paitu is used in China. So this is called the Great Firewall of China. So there is the Great Wall of China protecting China from the barbarians and then there is Great Firewall of China protecting it from the knowledge of the barbarians. Okay, Only that knowledge that is approved by the Chinese state would be distributed among the people. Not There won't be an open, open door policy towards foreign knowledge. So Xi Jinping has this ambitious Made in China 2025 uh, project. Just like in India, there, there is a Make in India, Atman Nirvah Bharat project. So China has its own uh, project because a lot of Chinese, a um, lot of foreign companies in China are closing down and leaving China because Chinese labor has become more expensive and uh, because China has, used to be famous for producing cheap goods uh, which was produced with the help of cheap labor 
and low taxes in the special economic zones. But with uh, Chinese labor becoming uh, more expensive, uh, this uh, thing has now is no longer possible. The, the growth of Chinese economy is no longer possible based on this cheap labor and low taxes. And so China is trying to uh, use a lot of technology. So technology is the new uh, dimension that China is trying to develop so that its economic growth continues. So these are some of the ideas that 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 have been uh, developing within China. So. So, Chinese being a, a communist state, so they de-emphasize the role of religion and use religion only, only for propagating its power, use religion strategically so that religion can help strengthen the Chinese nation. On the other hand, focus should be on science, so they want to encourage scientific thinking so that technology develops in China and China becomes number one in the world in terms of science and technology. So, so this is the uh, basic Chinese thinking on science and technology. Thank you. Traditional Chinese thought is based on the Confucian cosmology. So it is named after Confucius, but this cosmology is a product of generations of Chinese thinkers. And to an extent, even today in China, a kind of uh, a Confucian uh, mindset exists, although it has changed because of the communist revolution. So, uh, according to the Confucian cosmology, at the top is heaven or Thian. Thian is at the top, then below is the earth, heaven at the top, earth at the bottom, in the middle is the sun of heaven. Thian Tzu is the sun of heaven, the Chinese emperor or in modern parlance we will say the Chinese state. So, according to the Confucian cosmology, the Chinese state is a, an intermediary between heaven, which is the truth, the cosmic law, and us, that is uh, the people on earth. So, state plays a very important role in Chinese thinking. And at the center of this whole state system that exists on this earth is Chung Kuo, the Chinese nation. Chung Kuo is the Chinese nation at the center. In the middle is Qing, the capital where the government resides. So government is at the center and then there are the Chinese people. And beyond that there are two types of people. There are the tributaries and the barbarians. Those people who accept the greatness of Chinese civilization, they follow Chinese leadership are the tributaries. And those who refuse to challenge Chinese supremacy are the barbarians. So this is the ba a kind of a basic structure of Chinese foreign policy. China gives maximum importance to its own people, its own nation, China first. And then it has friendly relations with those countries which accept the Chinese conditions. China sometimes is very liberal. Those who are ready to accept Chinese conditions. China liberally uh, gives them what they want. But those nations which do not accept the supremacy of China, who challenge Chinese hegemony, they are considered to be barbarians. China looks at them with suspicion. An inch of ground to uh, these nations. So, you must keep in mind this Chinese cosmology while uh, the, the Confucian cosmology while studying China's foreign policy. Thank you.